Thanks, Travis. All right, so make sure you can hear me here. All right, so um, welcome. Thank you for showing interest in this topic. Um, I know relaunch is uh, natural reoccurrence in life as they happen, hopefully not for long time, periods of time, but they happen. If you're a consultant or on the agency side or a developer, you're probably doing them all the time. Um, and often as an SEO, um, it hurts me when I find out that it got skipped or ignored or at the last second, like five minutes before launch, somebody says, hey, we're getting ready to launch this. Um, hey, do you need to do something? All right, so, so we're gonna help you with planning today. As Travis said, this will be, um, this can serve as a checklist. It's in slide format. Um, I've got a search engine journal article um, that goes through this in more of a linear written um, format as well. And um, we'll just, we'll run with it. So I'll try to go through it pretty quickly, quickly enough to leave time for Q&A as a group. If there's anything I lost you on or that was really interesting or you have something very specific to what you're going through, catch me afterwards. I'll hang out on the side too. Um, to talk to you individually or we can um, talk in the community lounge as well. All right, so real quick, that's my family. Um, that's why I get no sleep. I'll try to keep my energy level up here. At least I'm not right after lunch. Um, a little bit about me. Um, been here in Kansas City for my entire career, proud of that. And Voltage, we're a digital agency in the River Market, founded in 05. Um, we have our, our focus on three key areas there. All right, so. Humor me for a moment before I get into um, aspects of SEO, um, because I work with developers in my office, designers every day. Um, I know HTML from the early days before WordPress and and doing everything by hand, which was a more painful era to do SEO in, especially. In some ways it might have been a little bit easier too, because that was before content marketing emerged so much, and so I could do SEO in a silo and didn't need other people. Um, but um, humor me here, I'd never do this. I think it's, you know, cheesy sometimes. I'm not gonna make everybody stand up or anything. But what I do wanna know is a little bit about everyone here and backgrounds, so I can tailor this as we go and make this more productive for both of us. Um, so how many people are familiar, where would you put yourself, if you put yourself as beginner or um, not very well versed in SEO, let me know that. I'm not going to shame you. People don't look around. Everybody can close their eyes. <laughs> All right, so I've got a handful in that camp. Um, who, who would say that they're really proficient in SEO? And so they'll, they're going to know every acronym I'm going to bring up, maybe, or most of them. Use the tools. All right. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So um, I'm going to assume we've got, we got, and I'm going to assume everybody else is kind of middle of the road here. I'm not going to ask that. So what we're going to do um, is I'm not going to pause and give you like the SEO 101. I'm also not going to go really deep into the super technical side of it and nerd out. Um, I'll do that on the side with you later if you want to. Um, but what I'm going to do afterwards is probably write or post a blog post within the next week that gives you a bunch of links to anything that's a bullet point in here that's talking about a concept or a tool or an acronym. So that will be helpful. Watch my Twitter over the next week for it um, because I'll post that as well as a follow up with, with my slide. Slides, excuse me. So that way, I'll, it'll just be links to resources on Google on a lot of different article sites where you can go dig in deep on what a canonical tag is or um, learn some of the best practices on a robots.txt file. Because what I'm more focused on is giving you this phased approach with a checklist that you can work through. So that way, if you're not responsible for SEO, you can check in with your SEO person or if you are the person that's going to be responsible for SEO, even though it's not your role, um, you can talk to your developer or if you are the developer, you can figure out that dynamic. So within your team or within yourself, if you wear all those hats, you can um, pause and make sure everything's in order here. So I will give you one, I have one background slide on SEO, just so you see my philosophy and how I organize things. It's pretty common. Um, Tyler here would probably maybe categorize things differently. He's welcome to challenge me um, and tell some jokes maybe too. He's, he's a great speaker, you should hear him tomorrow. Um, but um, indexing technical, these are like my three tried and true pillars of SEO. Indexing and technical are kind of separate topics, but I put them together. Indexing is making sure Google and Bing and any other crawler from a search engine can see your content, see your site, see all of it, 
so you can get credit for it later. Um, the technical part, there are some aspects of that. They're just the best practices. You do them, you troubleshoot them if you have to, to make sure that um, you're promoting your content, your site, so the search engines can see it. So in most cases, it's really easy. WordPress makes it easy. Um, sometimes you may have to do some troubleshooting there. Then you have your on-page phase. So this is the stuff that builds content relevance or relevance for your content uh, um, to make sure that the search engines understand that you're an expert on this subject matter or on these topics. So these are all the factors like um, your URL, your body copy, your image alt text, and um, a lot of your semantic coding within the site. So this is me talking about me, essentially. It's my content, I'm talking about myself to the search engines. Then you have the external influences or off-page factors as some people call them. Those are things like who links to who. Um, some signals from social media potentially debatable. Google debates them, but there's correlation data that states higher levels of engagement on social equal, equal better rate rankings, so we run with it. Um, there are also some other things like unlinked brand mentions that now because some, some of the external factors get spammed, but basically this is your authority category. So you've got relevance and on page of saying what I'm about and presenting that picture just like you do to your users, to the search engines, and then the authority side of it is I could come up with the best Kansas City plumbing company website overnight maybe not overnight, but I could write awesome content, put it all out there. Google's not going to know unless it looks at the external factors to see who links to me. I'm not going to have a link from the International Association of Plumbers or from review sites and other credible sources to validate that I really am who I say I am. So those are the external factors that weigh in your favor. So all of these can be impacted positively, negatively, neutral. Neutral is at best what you want to do in a, in a relaunch. Um, you don't want to harm yourself at the very least, even if you're not doing um, the relaunch or the, or the new site to help SEO, even if it's based on UX or business conditions or reasons. Um, those are things you want to think about. All right, the end of my background slide, the only background slide. All right, three phases. There's before migration, there's at launch, and then there's post launch. My wife is a scientist and obsessed with space and NASA. So this one's dedicated to her with some space themed references. So hopefully you're ready to buckle up and your seatbelt works because that's where we're going here. So first off, take a step back, goals and project plan. There's probably a good reason why you're relaunching. You're not putting yourself through this just for fun. Um, unless you're a designer and you like to re redesign things every week <laughs> and then relaunch them. Um, but business use cases, so there's a, probably a business reason behind this. So like everything, you should start with goals. Um, you're probably making some UX improvements along the way. Um, you're probably also trying to accomplish some marketing initiatives, whether those are um, around content, around structure, around your offerings, what you're doing. Um, and hopefully there's SEO improvements worked into that as well. Maybe you're on an older platform. Um, hopefully all these things work together. From there, now it gets hairy because now we're looking at content and information architecture. This is your opportunity if you're changing your information architecture, or essentially your sitemap and the structure of your content on the site. The more that you're doing in this, the more risk you're introducing. I'm not telling you not to do this, because this is the time to do it if you're investing the time, but don't ignore um, the fact that when you move pages around or have different pages and make pages you know, become obsolete, um, that you <laughs> just know that you're introducing another variable that you have to account for um, in SEO when you launch. But good you know, practices in SEO are, you know, just like UX, I'm now aligning my content, hopefully, around how people search and what they're looking for. So again, this is an opportunity where you can use silos of content, it's kind of an outdated term. I still use it because I, I can't get away from it. But if you're building your content into services, into products, into categories, or whatever that response needs to be for a conversion, um, that's where you want to map those keywords to content. So SEO best practices would be, you know, my homepage needs to rank for the most generic aspect of what I do. And then my category or service page needs to rank for that service. And if I have sub pages under that, that's where we get more granular. 
So in your sitemap, go from general to specific in terms of content. Naturally is the way you're probably going to design it anyway and architect it, but think about that. So know where your keyword focuses are. Um, if you're not really focused on SEO to begin with, this is a good time to think about that. So if you, got thing, you have things out of whack where you want to try to rank for cars in your car dealership on a page that's five levels deep, maybe you should think about flipping your, your site upside down. Um, canonicals, this is one of those words where I'm not going to go too deep into it, but these are, if you have multiple pages on your site that have 80%, you know, or, 20, or more than 20% matching text with another page, you may have the red Mustang convertible page and the blue Mustang convertible page. And the only thing that's different is the name of the color or the, or the color in there. F for a legit reason, you know, you have duplicate content or you have a product um, page that appears in five different categories. Um, that's another legit reason to have duplicate content. Well, the search engines struggle with duplicate content. They don't like it because they don't want to show five of your pages that are almost nearly identical in the search results. They want to show one or two and show some others. Um, same thing with if you sell a product um, that you're using the manufacturer's description and 15 other people sell that same product, you're going to have against other domains and other sites duplicate content as well. This is something you need to think about. So if you're in e-commerce or if you know you have duplicate content, this is a strategy you'll want to think about before launch as well, especially if you're introducing new content um, compared to what your old site architecture had. Even if your sitemap doesn't change at all, think about if you're moving to a different technology, um, you may be changing U URLs, which even if it's a one-to-one -one match on your sitemap, your URLs may be changing. It may be going from .php to just um, the directory extension and be defaulted. Or um, even if in WordPress, if you're, you know, what's nice is if you're in WordPress and you're just introducing a new theme, your URLs probably aren't changing if you're not doing anything related to sitemap at the same time. So that's a nice advantage of WordPress compared to some not so nice, um, even open source systems. All right, that's a big one. And we'll talk about some of the impacts in a minute. On page. So this is the more traditional stuff. This is what you're th probably thinking about or somebody's thinking about um, probably top of mind. The first thing somebody's going to say meta tags. Um, but all of these things work together. There's no one magical element that's going to guarantee rankings. All these working together is that beautiful picture of, okay, we use these, we build context, we use the same phrasing and, and um, terminology throughout every one of these, from the URL to the titles, the title tag, to meta description tag, headings, body copy, image, alt text. All of these are painting the picture of what you're about and can strengthen what you're doing. So don't ignore these before launch, especially if um, you don't have a plugin or don't have something coded that will semantically complete these for you. And even if it auto-populates these based on whatever the file name you uploaded is, your file names might not be great because you may have it may just be image 123.jpg straight off of your camera or your computer or whatever it might be. So take advantage of the opportunities you have to go page by page or even file by file or if you can do something dynamically and not have to go touch every file, every tag. Um, think about that because that's better than, again, having it be blank. Some of the worst things you can do are leave it up to Google to guess or populate those for you by leaving a meta description blank. While it's not going to help you by itself in rankings, it can hurt you because you're leaving out a key piece of information that Google cares about. And for example, I mean, your title tag, a well-written title tag and a well-written meta description will be used as the blue link and the two or three lines of text under that in the search results page. So that's how much emphasis Google has on it because it goes beyond just search. That's a UX thing too. So if it's poorly written or doesn't exist and Google decides to pull something from your site, I've seen it pull footer links and information and it strips out the links. And so you're like copyright 2014 as like the meta description, it's gonna hurt your click-through rate too for people coming from Google through to your site because they're not seeing a helpful cue of what they what what to click through to. All right, redirects. Two slides on this, the why. Redirects are critical. If you hear no other word today, hear redirects. <laughs> because this is 
if, if no other factors play into this, this is the one in the indexing and technical. This is where you stop being found and you disappear and you watch your work. You know, I'll have somebody come to me, I'll see their analytics show that their organic traffic dropped to almost nothing only maybe brand queries or brand name or company name um, because they didn't do any redirects. So that's a hostile thing for, from an SEO perspective. It also is from a UX perspective. So if I didn't do any redirects and all my URLs changed, now anybody who sees a link on another site and clicks on it is going to get a 404. How many 404s are people going to get before they give up on me even if they know I exist and I'm a legit brand? So redirects transcend everything and are the one thing that if somebody came to me five minutes before we're launching and I could do nothing else, I would find a way to pause long enough to plan out the redirects. Now, if you have 10,000 pages on your site, it's going to take more than five minutes. If you have 10 pages on your site, I could do it in five minutes. So this is where you want to get people to pause. If you're not responsible for launching it, if you're not the developer, just slow the process down for a moment because it's better to delay than to launch without redirects. So in addition to UX, 404s and indexing, link value too. So getting deeper into that external, this touches on that external factor as well. So people who link to, link to you are passing link value or link juice through to you, votes, their votes or their the giving you authority status um, based on them linking to you. So now if that's a 404, Google forgets about that too. So you lose that. So this is a, like a cascading thing if you don't do redirects. I saw a question over here. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how I plan it, but definitely, even if it was like a, you know, .NET, all these URLs are .NET, you still can drop those in your HT access. So that's the, the safest, most permanent place to put it, but WordPress has its own redirection plugins as well. There's a plethora of them. I know my team keeps changing them because some of them are not very lightweight and impact performance of the site overall, even though <laughs> they're not public facing. Um, but that's an excellent question of, of doing it. So even if it's a, you know, .NET or some other foreign crazy parameterized URL that wasn't even a, hasn't even been a page in 10 years, but Google won't forget about it, or it was a really, you know, it was linked from the New York Times, so you want to maintain that link value and redirect it into your new site, um, you can do that within WordPress or at the, at the server level in Apache. Um, so how? So first, this could be time consuming as I mentioned. Um, you want to crawl the existing site. The easiest way to do this is not do it after launch. It, it takes 10 times as much time. If you wait till after launch, you have to go f find an old copy of the site, restore a backup somewhere on hosting you probably don't even have if you change technologies and went from .NET to, to, <laughs> to LAMP stack or if um, or, or, or just you have to go through external tools like search, Google Search Console or other places to hunt down what old URLs Google knew about and you're not going to get them all. So I, I recommend, I love Screaming Frog. It's like a 99 pounds per year, which is 150, 140 bucks um, for your license. Um, there are other tools like Deep Crawl and there are some new ones like, uh, I can't remember the new one I just, just tested um, a few weeks ago. So crawling tools. They'll let you do, I mean, they're awesome because they'll go grab everything um, from the site and, the, and Screaming Frog will go pretty deep. You can customize the settings and tell it how many levels deep. Um, it will pull down everything, all the meta information as well. It'll pull down canonicals and all kinds of um, server statuses and if there are redirects in place already, it'll give you all that information. You can bring it into a spreadsheet. You can go old school and take it to Excel. You can put it in a Google Sheet. You can create pivot, pivot tables, do whatever you want with it, but essentially you need to get that information and even, and it's going to find a lot of URLs that you're like, we haven't used that in years or there are a whole bunch of vanity like root level, you know, pages that were for like a one day promotion. Um, and so you can decide what value there is in redirecting them versus laying them 404. Um, but I recommend if you have the time, figure out how to redirect everything you can. So you're going to take in that spreadsheet, um, what I do as a non-developer um, is take my column of, of um, old site URLs and have a column right next to it of what I'm mapping it to. 
um, and hand that off. And that way it can be, you know, a query can be run to get it into HC access or it can be copied and pasted or uploaded through a text file, maybe to, depending on the plugin you're using as well for re redirection. Um, you can, uh, with some nuances to this, if pages or sections are going away entirely, you can redirect to the next level up. So if you have a product category, we're not even selling that product anymore, redirect to the most relevant page. Google and Bing will tell you something different. They'll be like, no, 404 that. 404 is a, is a good thing because it means we should take it out of our index. Um, sitting in, in the room with Google and Bing saying that to a bunch of SEOs, it's comical because everybody looks at each other and they're like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, we've worked hard to get the credibility that we have um, and authority status with our site. So, And it's not spelled out. I'm not telling you about any like black hat areas here. I mean, this is a common practice. So figure out where to redirect, um, even if it's a home page. Um, Google will sort it out over time, and if you shouldn't get credit for that content or those links anymore, they'll drop that off um, off on their end. You don't have to worry too about it. So you can have um, many to one as well. So you can have 10 pages redirecting to the same page on the new site if you're reducing content or it's obsolete as well. All right, so here's an example that's Redsheet. Might be a little bit hard to see. You can grab it in the slides. I'll be happy to actually probably send you a file like this if you want or this is this one was in Excel versus a, a Google Sheet, but essentially here's my old URLs, here's my new site URL, and I've even used one master spreadsheet to even plan out what my new title and meta description is. So I have one just giant sheet as I'm doing everything in it, um, so that my team can collaborate off of it and copy paste or make sure that we're not missing any important um, pages for SEO. All right. That's the pre-launch checklist. Now, we're gonna launch, and this is SpaceX, and it didn't blow up. This was successful. So at launch, there's just one slide here. And with the, the, prof, the most critical part of this, especially if you're responsible for SEO and you're not the developer, um, is know when they're gonna launch the site and what their checklist is. And if you are the developer, make sure the SEO aspects of the are incorporated in your launch checklist. You probably have your tried and true QA launch checklist. You should, and you know what you're going through to launch the site. So ensure that everybody is on the same page if it's not just you as the one person responsible for everything. And um, while clients may love to have you launch it at like two in the morning on like, you know, a Sunday, all right, make sure your whole team's awake and they know what's going on so we don't get to like 10 a.m. on Monday and embrace freaking out because we make $1,000 um, you know, every 10 minutes on our e-commerce site and the e-commerce site's down or nobody can get to it um, because we're not in Google anymore or everything that was in Google is now going to a 404. Um, so um, just make sure you've got your timing lined out and you have your post-launch uh, action plan ready to go because you're going to want to jump into it. So, speaking of post-launch, this is often what we feel like when we launch. We're like, cool, we should celebrate. I don't know what to do. We just launched it. I, is there something, is there a next step here? It's that awkward moment where it's like, oh, oh, there's a, there, the, in this case, the camera's on. I should grab this 1970-era microphone and talk to somebody. <laughs> but, but, th but this totally translates. We work so hard to get this thing launched, and we get it launched, and hopefully it's not late on a Friday afternoon where everybody's checking out, um, or hopefully it, th it's not this reaction where everybody's now asleep because we stayed up and pulled all-nighters to hit a deadline, and this is awesome how awkward it is to sleep in space. <laughs> Uh, but but hopefully you know those one of those two things is like we're excited we're getting we're ready to move on with our day move on to the next thing. No, we're not. We need to go through our post-launch um, checklist. And so okay, we're coming right back to redirects. The site went live. Um, now we need to come back and validate proper implementation. So I'm not saying you need to go check every redirect, but you have your spreadsheet. Spot check. Start clicking on some of the links or copy and paste them in your browser from your um, from your, your spreadsheet that you had before of the old site links and make sure they're really going to the pages you mapped out. I'm not, it's not that I don't have any trust in developers, love developers, but at the same time, things go weird and things don't go from dev to live like you thought they might have or from the staging site up. So just make sure they're implemented properly. Also, 
Um, redirectcheck.com isn't even really a tool. It's just a page that you go and plug in your URL. And for non-developers like me, it'll quickly tell me the server code and what's happening there. You want to make sure it's a 301 redirect and not a 302. Even though Google says they treat 302s like 301s now, I still don't trust it enough. There's no reason to not have it just be a 301, which is page permanently moved, which is their acceptable way of transferring all the credibility from the old page to the new page, at least in the short term. It's up to you to make sure that content is as strong and lines up with, with what, um, what you had in terms of credibility previously. So just go check some of these, make sure they're, they're redirecting and that you're in good shape there. So the dev to live audit, I mentioned sometimes things don't get pushed up. A, a database gets missed, a table gets missed, um, a plugin gets missed, um, especially if you're operating a totally separate staging site, you know, did everything get pushed over? Or if you're just doing a theme update, maybe you added some new functionality or you're going to turn it on at launch and maybe you know, CSS uploaded, but nothing, you know, some of your SEO features didn't. So just run through this, especially if they're dynamic features. If you've got thousands of pages and you're not writing custom meta descriptions or titles for every single one, you have formulas everywhere where it's product name plus model number plus name of my website. Make sure those are working because those could look really silly if they still have the slugs in there and you'll have a million duplicate. Um, slug based or template based um, <laughs> tags. So also make sure your on page optimization. If you went to all that work to write the tags and put them in, um, especially if you did it by hand in WordPress through Yoast or something like that, make sure those went live as well. Um, most of the time I don't ever catch anything here, but there are occasions where you want to know this now and not a month from now. Um, because if everything else was done properly, but a couple of things didn't go live, even though your site might get indexed and your redirects were great, um, some of your SEO benefits um, and on-page things might not have carried through. All right, so this is the newer, more fun category. That's sarcasm. Um, this is the new thing that SEOs have to worry about. Um, you know, we're in mobile getting two, essentially, right now. The first one was a few years ago. Everybody had to be mobile friendly. Um, everybody jumped, thankfully. F thankfully, we're mostly on the responsive bandwagon and not adaptive and five other types of technologies and Google wouldn't say anything about it. Again, like Jim before me spoke about, you know, most of the time, good or bad, if Google says it, that's what we end up doing, so whatever. Um, but page speed, page speed. So this has been important for a few years. It was a tiebreaker factor. It wasn't like an algorithm variable that was going to give you a huge boost. Uh, but Google is now, in addition to wanting things to be mobile friendly, is, uh, is now shifting to a mobile first index. So they're only going to index, the entire index of Google and ranking system is going to be based on the mobile version of your website. So if you haven't thought about that, think about it this weekend. <laughs> you, ha you have a week or three. I, I actually, of cro uh, across maybe 200 websites um, that I have access to through Search Console, get the first notification yesterday that one of ours went <coughs> live on mobile friendly. Which is nice that they're notifying us because they don't always have to do that and they choose not to a lot of the time. Um, so th they've got a lot of different tools, a couple different places you can get to the mobile. There's the mobile friendly test, which has been around for a few years. Now they have the mobile speed test as well. And it's really fascinating. Like if you're an e-commerce site or know the value of a conversion, it'll show you where you are and you can take the slider and move it down by tenths of a second. And it'll tell you how much, if you plug in a couple inputs of how much money you make in certain timestamps or what the average order is. It will use some factors that they know on click-through rate and bounce rate and all that to tell you how much money in a year <coughs> additional revenue you'll make by speeding up your site. I mean, it just started, so we'll have to trust it and see if their data is correct in a year, but... That, that's going to be whatever it renders to their Google bot that is looking at mobile. So it's going to be responsive typically, or adaptive will still work as well. Um, so it's whatever viewpoint it can see. So if the user experience is not good on a device, iPad gets into the gray area there because things could render more like desktop versus more like a phone. Um, but they're going to evaluate you based on closer to a phone be because they're looking at they're looking at spacing between buttons and size of elements 
um, exclusively to make sure everything is op optimized there, quote unquote? That's an excellent question. Go run that mobile friendly test before you even start worrying about speed, the speed test. All right, so now indexing, and we're back to indexing. Redirects could have destroyed you on indexing, but you've already taken care of those and validated those. But now that you're, everything's clean, you're ready to, to, to tell Google, hey, we've moved, we've updated. Hopefully you're doing this all within kind of a day of launch and you're not spreading all these steps out over a week. But as quickly as you can validate everything, you'll want to upload or submit, uh, validate your XML sitemap. So XML sitemaps, Hopefully you don't have a static one that you have to generate through a generator. Uh, if you're in WordPress, Yoast and many other tools um, will dynamically generate it. So every time you create a new page on your site, it will, the site will automatically add it to the XML sitemap. This is a file that humans don't look at unless you're an SEO and care about it. Um, but it's like the index page for the search engines. Anytime they come to visit your site, they look at your XML sitemap. Are there any new URLs that I need to crawl? This is the modern version of submitting your URLs to Google you know, 10, 15 years ago. This is what they look for. You <coughs> wanna make sure that in that file, you don't have any 404s. You don't wanna have any 301 redirects in it. You wanna have the destination URLs in it. Again, if you're using the plugins and technology, they'll take care of a lot of this for you. But still test it before you submit it to Google. And you wanna make sure it's the canonical URL, the final <laughs> URL, or the one you prefer if you have five versions of the practically the same page that live on five different URLs. So um, when you feel like it's in good shape, you wanna submit it to Google through Google Search Console, to Bing, through Bing Webmaster Tools. What you wanna be careful about though, and again, the reason why you wanna spend five minutes and go click on some of the URLs in it and make sure they're all legit is that the last number I heard from Google was 10%, but Bing said a few years ago, if your, your sitemap has more than 1% of error, whether it's 404s, redirects issues, in the sitemap, they stop trusting it. So now you lose access to a really good signal when I have a new page and it goes in there. If they're not looking at my sitemap, it's harder for the, me to get them to come back sooner to see my new content, especially if it's time sensitive or I don't wanna wait 45 days for it to get into the index. And then monitoring. So now we're launched, we've taken care of all these steps, but we wanna watch this thing probably daily at, at, at a minimum, probably not hour or, or by the minute, but at least daily. Stay on this, make sure your indexing is still happening. You use Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools for this. They'll give you information about how many pages they've indexed. You can compare that to how many pages you know you have on the site. If you've had Google Search Console set up long enough prior, to launching, you can see how that compares to your old site and what it was. It'll tell you, it'll tell you as another um, tool about 404s that finds HTML issues, duplicate tags, all that stuff. So monitor that daily. Um, go add more redirects if you miss stuff or if Google knows about some URL that nobody else knows about, which is weird and you're like, no, how would, whatever. Just go take care of that. Obviously you'll watch traffic, but you don't wanna wait till you see the traffic dip. You wanna see these things first. Yeah, so, if you, so how long should you monitor after you launch? So I, I would launch day, I would watch it daily for a week. If I have no issues, if I'm not seeing any errors and having to go fix them every day when Google finds more as it continues to index, I would say then you, maybe you could go to weekly. You're, for 90 days, need to be paying attention at least weekly, taking a look. Um, because that's the longest length of a spider cycle for Google to come back and revisit content might be up to 120 sometimes, but it's gotten so much faster. I, I would say you're gonna see the bulk of it in the first 10 days now. Thankfully, Google doesn't talk about it since they talked about caffeine, their faster indexing engine a few years ago. Um, but I keep seeing it get into a shorter window, thankfully. And then a follow up to that. So then if you do find a bunch of errors, do you every, take a time, like uh, spend some time mm -hmm. on one day Yeah, so you can mark items one at a time as fixed in Search Console, and it's painful. Most of the time, that's what you have to do if you 
didn't put in any redirects and now you're seeing the 404s after the fact and you couldn't get that old sitemap and Google will only show you like a thousand of them a day and you have to fix those, wait for the next thousand the next day. I had a client where for 23 days we had to watch for the next thousand and address them and spend three hours a day for 23 days. Weekends included because we wanted to keep that window as short as we could. And they were a large e-commerce site that um, does $150,000 a day. Would have been very important. It would have been very, well, I mean, they were on Magento, so we can talk about that as a different issue. <laughs> they weren't on WordPress or WooCommerce or anything else. So, um, but yeah, excellent question. It really depends on how many issues you're seeing. If everything's pretty clean, small site, no issues, you could go to a week, you could go to a month. Um, but just don't ignore it because there are hidden issues and things that you won't necessarily notice until you'll get trailing indicators like traffic which are painful to see because traffic equals revenue and now you're a week or two or three out and you're like you could have in that window taken it and fixed it proactively. All right, so I'm wrapping up here. Your ongoing SEO and man, I don't know why I could stare at this for like hours. <laughs> it's so like gratifying for whatever reason. Um, but now we're in ongoing SEO. So you might have started just thinking about SEO or thought about what you had to do as a bare minimum or maybe thought about strategically in your launch process. It's not set it and forget it. So I'd be remiss if I acted like it was one time. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because I'm an agency and we love the retainer model and getting you on the hook for a long time. That's not it. It's truly built around the fact that um, so many of these things take rinse and repeat optimization practices and you're rolling out new content. So in your bigger stack or, or mix of digital marketing, um, you're probably generating content for your blog um, or for you know ever, new evergreen content or whatever it might be um, to push on social. Well, you can optimize that as well. And it should be optimized. It should play into the fact of more is typically better for SEO as well in terms of content, if it's good content. And so, and, and you're not going to hit the home run the first time. So you're going to find that, yeah, I optimized this page for this specific keyword, and now I'm ranked, you know, in the 30s. Now, maybe I should think about adding five more pages because that's what everybody else has, or it's long form is being ranked better than short form. So it's an iterative process that I like to take in a more agile fashion than to try to get it all right and work for six months to have this perfect strategy and roll it out. And then some things were great, some things weren't great. It's kind of neutral overall because it needs to, needs to evolve. So keys to success here. We all want this experience at the end of the day. Um, not because of the trauma that they went through in Apollo 13 to get there. I want to clarify that point. I'm not making light of this, but um, the keys to success. So be flexible working with content, um, UX, dev, IT, other stakeholders. I mean, don't think about hosting till the very end um, and then realize you can't even get to the HT access file and now you've got to do things the hard way or you can't do, do something like that. Um, Think about all this in advance, have conversations if you're more, again, if it's more than just you controlling the whole process. Redirects are critical, if nothing else, do that. And um, when you're in that awkward celebratory moment after you, you launched, don't forget to get into the post-launch checklist as well and validation. And so then ultimately, again, it's not a one-time thing, so have a plan after that to transition when you're done monitoring and validating. What's my next step with SEO? And let's incorporate that, this into our um, ongoing marketing activities. So um, I've got a few articles, one, one especially in that mapping, uh, optimizing, um, optimizing a you know, site for multiple keywords, not trying to put all your focus on the home page. Um, I've got an article on that, as well as two, two on the topic of relaunch. So that's why this is obviously an important topic for me. Um, if you hit up my author page there, there are a few resources there. So um, with that being said, we've got, um, I've got some time for questions. I've got 10 minutes. So redirects will be a little bit more complicated because you're going from something else to WordPress. 
and migration and relaunch and all those are in the same boat to me. They all kind of follow the same process. So even if you're not changing, you're just going, even if you're not changing the look and feel at all, nothing's changing for a user, check those URLs especially. <coughs> if content, nothing else is changing, but you're just changing platforms and you're coming into WordPress or any, or going out of WordPress, nobody in this room is, but if that, if that were the case, check your URLs because they may not match up exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all good. Um, but um, it's way better than it was before. Um, they have some content on a subdomain that's important content. And we are trying to debate whether we bring that into our main domain. Or to your point, you know, moving around pages, especially pages that are like important and have a lot of value. Should we keep that third part of that is should we space that out away from our relaunch? Excellent questions and things you're considering, Alyssa. So she's got a client who is who has a separate subdomain with content on it, trying to figure out if they should migrate that in with the brand new site that's launching as well. So I'm big on controlling variables. So first off, I would not do those at the same time because if it's a cluster, you're not going to know what did it or, or traffic-wise. You can have some stability and keep it and make sure you get through all the issues and then you can cleanly know where it's going to go in the architecture and you can cleanly migrate in later unless there's a business reason where this needs to happen now or a branding issue or something like that where it's going to look obsolete or or it's going to cost you twice as much to keep hosting things separately and you need to do that now um, on the other on the flip side of it of the decision of whether we should migrate in or not I actually just wrote a proposal for <laughs> for for a global company the other day that's just going to audit that fact alone because because the site that the that's like this much of their business in terms of revenue, they want to migrate into the parent company site, but the parent but the parent company site SEO sucks, and they have no. So it's like, do we want to take something that's ranking really well and doing really well and move it in to get the business hierarchy right and the brand hierarchy right? So we're evaluating that and looking at all options and looking at a lot of you know factors like their you know domain rank and page rank, you know, some of the Moz scoring, we're looking at link value, all of those factors to see what the risks are of moving in. So that's a very individual so decision. Thank you, Mary. you guys uh, the rise of voice search? Yeah. Yeah, so voice search and schema markup. So schema markup was a wait and see type of thing when it first rolled out in 09 or 2010 for me, early getting wide adoption. Um, wait and see because it's a lot of work to put something in your site that we don't. that's not a ranking factor, may or may not help you. A lot of industries didn't like it because now you're putting extra code in your pages. So Google can take your information and keep people on Google and serve it up there. Um, so that was kind of the backlash they got early on, but some of the correlation data, much like social is, the more structured data markup you have in your site, the better your rankings are, even though the search engines will scream all day long that we don't use that as a ranking signal. So it's a best practice if the investment's worth it, especially if you're way down on your checklist of optimization and you can invest that. Um, if you have code that can dynamically plug it in, great. There's some plugins that are okay, some that aren't. Um, it is. It's context. And so that's a really critical piece of it. Um, the other part of that voice search, um, this is something that's talked about constantly. I, Tyler, you probably talk about voice search as well. You've presented on it. And so what's interesting for me, I, d I work with a handful of national or international brands. I would say that 80% of my clients are in Kansas City and they're SMBs. So we're not in an enterprise space where I've got Coca-Cola or somebody and we can go throw a whole bunch of money into creating a chat bot or AI or whatever it might be and capitalize on voice search. Um, it's not usable for me yet and this is so frustrating. I have friends who are you know, on the Simpo board with me globally who are Bing Ads evangelists um, on 
you know, at, high up at Google, everywhere else, and they're giving all these talks around the country about voice search and what what's coming, and they have been for three years, but my response is until you give me search query data of how people are searching, like I can get for text, for, for searches people type, I can't change my behavior. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't ignore it, I'm not ignoring it, but at the same time, I'm guessing in some areas about my personas and how, what their behavior is, or I have to look at external cues. I can't look at and, and react and, and optimize on my site based on what's really happening. So until they start showing me the 30 word question that somebody asked Alexa or Cortana or Siri, I can't really read and react and optimize through that process. So I'm not ignoring it, but you know, I'm definitely taking care of the best practices like schema and things like that that will help some. Um, but until I have a really good use case for it, it's not part of my day to day yet. So I might sound like a dinosaur to some people from bigger agencies and companies in this room who have their own chat bot, but I don't yet. Yeah. Plain text, both. Um, I was just going to say that it seems to me like we should be taking the time to just make sure all of our stuff's getting redirected explicitly to the. Speaker. Yes. So I had a client who came to me was losing 30% organic traffic consistently every month for the past six months. And the first thing I found, and probably the most, there, there are a few things that are causing it, but the most. <laughs> The frustrating one is that they went to HTTPS back six months ago and did not configure redirects from every version of the HTTP, HTTP www. So you've got those four by default now versions. Make sure they all <coughs> redirect into your primary one, whether it's with www or without it on the HTTPS. And make sure they're all doing 301 redirects. Um, because what I found was one, two of them were mirroring. The ones that didn't have the S were mirroring the site. One of them was doing a 302. So I was like, none of these are doing the right thing. Um, and it's not going to kill you. Google can figure out how to work around that, but it's not helping you either. And so you're just creating more confusion um, and not helping yourself and negating some of what you might get by the tiebreaker of having being on HTTPS. Right, I've got two more minutes, so I'm Maybe one more question if anybody's got one. Picking back off this, so a lot of people are switching over just HTTPS only. I know there's, you know, a set of search console and uh, redirect to it. Is there any other type of best practices you'd recommend for exclusively just secure connection changes? Yeah, so that's, that's overlooked. Redirects probably get missed in that more so than they do the website launch process because you're thinking about a lot of factors for launch. If you're like, it's just an IT thing, which is a hosting thing, let's just go, or Flywheel gives you, an, you know, SSL for free, like many of them do, and they're going to configure, make sure you understand what WordPress is going to do for you, um, or what your host is doing, or what you're doing to make sure that all of those are going to 301 to that one primary version. Because that's a case where you're not changing URLs, like on a page by page basis, but you're globally changing everything. And so it, it should take five minutes to do it right. Um, but if it's done wrong in those same five minutes and you don't validate it and you don't go check it in like redirectcheck.com, check a few of your, your homepage and a couple of interior pages to see, make sure they're truly doing a 301, then um, yeah, that's, a, that's like an iceberg type of danger. <laughs> Yeah, redirectcheck.com, you go there and it's got one box that says do, do a trace or whatever. You put your URL in there and then you hit trace and it'll spit out the server heading or the server codes, tell you exactly what happens. Which is nice because you may have five redirects and you don't realize them. You realize it just by putting it in your browser. So I'm out of time. Um, I appreciate the awesome questions, though. This is fun. And if you have any more I didn't get answered, something pops up, catch me um, here to the side or afterwards. Thanks. Thanks.